I got up this morning and did what I always do. I'm a creature of habit. I just am. Many of you are too, I know. I get up at four something usually because I go to bed early and I go down the hall from our bedroom and there's a long runner carpet. But in front of me, our cat is already, her name is Nutmeg. She's already sensed something's happening. So she races in front of me and flops. Because the idea is I'm kind of like, you're not getting past me till you do the back thing. So I have to bend down and scratch her, and she just crawls along in ecstasy. And then she's done. Then I go down three stairs into the living room. And invariably, as I walk from the bedroom, pet the cat, and go into the living room, I just say, Lord, thank you for this home. I love our home. I'm so grateful. And as I go through the living room into the kitchen where we have a coffee pot, I'm going to make my wife coffee. We have some skylights. And, and if the conditions are right, I can look up and I can see stars or the moon or something. And I say, Lord, this is so good. So I go into the kitchen and finish that task, coffee. Then I go back to the living room and downstairs. There's like 10 stairs. And I descend into what my grandkids call Papa's lair. Elise named it that. Papa, that's your lair. So I go down the stairs, and above me is a picture of a sailboat, and then there's a rattan fish. To my right is all my spear guns. You know, I got a lot. And on the left is flags that have billfish or large fish we catch in Mexico. Then I get to the bottom of the stairs, and there's my triathlon bike on a trainer. And then to the left is my desk, and in the desk... On the desk is my laptop and a monitor. I love my home. I have everything there. It's so beautiful, and I love being there. And we're five minutes from here. We're right over there. We're seven or eight minutes from the water. There's enough space in front to park all the cars of our small group as soon as we start meeting in person again. And we get along with all our neighbors. We got Eric and Robin to the left. We got Steve and Mary to the right. We got Lynn and a little house in back. And we have Jeff and Suzanne at the beginning of our little private drive there. It's like heaven. Doesn't it sound like that? It's just like heaven. It's our home. But it's not perfect by a long shot. It's not. You see, in our home, we have redwood, thin wall construction with no insulation. There might be insulation in a few of the interior walls, but we suspect there's none. And it's all vaulted ceilings. So... So what it means is whatever temperature it is outside, within an hour or two, it's going to be that temperature on the inside. If it's hot, it's hot. If it's cold, it's cold. Those nights that are 40, 42, Heather and I are bundling up and we're, we're, we're trying to stay warm. And you might say, turn the heater on. That's a good idea. But you got an old school heater in a house with vaulted ceilings, old redwood construction with no insulation. It costs a fortune to heat this place. And we do it when our friends are there, and we do it occasionally on a night or two for us. So that's kind of a problem, right? And then the other problem is, from the garage come these crickets. And they go into Papa's lair, where the kitty finds them, and she brings them up and puts them on the bed for Heather as a present. <laughs> you got pets, you know, or cats especially, you know how it works. Like, Mom, look, I brought you something icky. That's how it works. So our home is not perfect. It sounded like it, but it's not. This is really, really important. Why is that? We have two homes. If you're a believer, you've invited Jesus into your heart. You have the home you live in now. Then you have a permanent forever home. That's, what, that's what's promised in the gospel for us. So we're going to talk today about our home, but our forever permanent home. Jesus said, says some things about this in the book of John. In John chapter 14, verses 1 through 4, he's calming his disciples because he's preparing to go to the cross. And they've been talking about this. He's been sharing with them, but he knows they don't get it. And this is going to be an alarming, shocking event for them. And he's trying to prepare them. So he says, he goes, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. And if that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me 
that you also may be where I am. You know the place where I am going. And if you're a believer, this is important. Your eternity is secured. A believer means that you've, you've confronted your own sin, your own inability to make it right, to perfect your behavior and your thought life. And, and sometimes you just, you don't know what else to do. And Jesus came to fulfill prophecy, to pay the one price once and for all, and then for our sin. And then if you invite him in, he lives in you. You're saved. And you know what else that does? It, it, you're, the price for your sin is paid. It also assures your permanent forever home. And I, want, and I want to tell you, make sure you know this. You don't have to be good to get there. You don't have to earn more points. You don't have to do this, do that, or do anything. He already did it. He did it. That's the beauty of it. He just says, believe in me. Invite me into your heart, and you're saved, and your forever home with me is secure. So what does this home look like? Maybe many of you are like me. I, I thought about this idea of heaven. I think I can't often relate to it. And it's not that I don't believe it and think about it, but I'm doing my life, you know. I'm busy, and yeah, heaven's that someday place. But here's what the Bible says about heaven, and there's some other things we'll use to describe it. Scripture's very clear that heaven is God's dwelling place. It's the location of his throne from which he rules the universe. And that's a fact. And it also says in Scripture that we change out of this body and we move on, we transition, we will be with him forever. That's not a maybe. That's a certainty. And we're going to receive new bodies. Praise the Lord. I got this knee thing going on and I got a couple of hips and Heather will tell you about my back. And Man, I'm getting eager for the new body. I don't know if you're like me, but oh man. And also, we're going to see friends and family. Anybody who, who's invited Christ into their life has gone before us, they're there. And it's going to be just a rejoicing to see them and spend eternity with them, eternity with them in the presence of the Lord. But here's some other things that are true about heaven. The two most dominant mental health struggles in America are anxiety and depression. There's none of that in heaven. None. Scripture says, Revelations, no more tears. There's no more that emotional pain. There's no more physical pain. There's no more grief. There's no more sadness. There's no more fear. There's no COVID. There's no COVID in heaven. Imagine that. That alone might be enough for you to say, I want to go. There's none of these things here that we suffer with, that we're either in, anticipating, or just coming out of. None of it is there in heaven. That's because of the victory that Jesus won by conquering death when he rose from the tomb. And it's a gift for us. It's nothing we can win. It's nothing we can earn. It's nothing we can accumulate. It's a gift. We have to do that strange thing and just receive it. And be vulnerable and open our hearts and receive it. But I have a question for you about this. Heaven is real. So, so, so does knowing you're going to heaven impact your life today? Does it impact your life today? And I'm here to tell you that I be, believe it absolutely does. And we're going to talk about how that works here. I'm a big fan of C.S. Lewis. And if you never read another book on Christianity, if you haven't read this already, read Mere Christianity, one of the finest books on Christianity ever written. Each page gives you these unassailable truths that just overwhelm your senses. I've literally never stopped reading it. Always go back. Always go back. It's so anointed. And he said something that intrigued me about heaven, and we're going to talk about this today. He said, aim at heaven, and you will get earth thrown in. Aim at earth and you'll get neither. Aim at heaven, you'll get earth thrown in. Aim at earth and you'll get neither. And scripture reaffirms this for us. Paul writes in the book of Colossians these words. 
Since then, you've been raised with Christ. So, so understand that, that when you receive Christ, Scripture tells us the old life is gone and the new life has come. The old self is gone and the new self has come. So it says here, since you have been raised with Christ. And then Paul says, set your heart, your emotional life, that, that, that sensation part of you that experiences the world emotionally around you, your heart, set it on things above. Where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Why is he seated? What's that about? We know in Old Testament times and all the way up to the time of Christ among the Jews, the way you handled sin was you went to the temple and the priest made a sacrifice to atone for, which means cover your sin. And the priest could never sit down because the work was never done because there was new sin after the old sins had been atoned for. It just never could finish. And the Lord knew what this would do and he promised centuries before, but I'm going to send one who's going to finish that by becoming the sacrifice for all your sin once and for all. And so what did he do then? What did Jesus do? He did something the priest could never do. He sat down. To tell us that, it says in the Gospels, it is finished. There's no more work to be done. Good news, because we don't have to do any more work either to be saved. We don't. And then he goes on to say, set your minds on the things above, not on earthly things, for you died. Remember, the old self is gone. You died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Okay, so you might be asking, so, so what does that mean exactly? How does that work? Well, aiming at heaven teaches us how to live on earth. Aiming at heaven teaches us how to live on earth. And why is that? Because whatever you think your future is will radically determine your present. Whatever you think your future is will radically determine your present. I borrowed a story from Pastor Tim Keller, founder of Redeemer Church in New York City, and I love the way he tells us. And we're going to, in this story, see how this works, this idea that what your future is will determine your present. So, so here's the scene. Imagine two people are, who are given the exact same job. Person A is over here in a room with certain kinds of tools, furniture, you know, water, the air conditioning, all that stuff. He's all set up to do this work. Person B is over here in an identical room, identical room. Person A here, person B here. All the same tools, all the same conditions. Uh, the atmosphere is the same. Everything's identical. Everything's the same. And all person A has to do and all person B has to do is take part one and screw it into part two. And there's two boxes of these parts. Part uh, person B, the same thing. Part one, screw it into part two. Two boxes, it's identical in every conceivable way. Everything is. There's a subtle difference, though. You tell person A, your annual salary for doing this work is $1,000. You tell person B, your annual salary for doing this work is $10 million. So one day, they're on a break. They're in the lunchroom. And they don't see each other. They got two different rooms they work in. And person A knows that person B does what he does. So he goes, oh, man, this sucks, doesn't it? Part one is a part two. Oh, I'm bored to tears. I hate my job. I hate doing this. Doesn't it drive you crazy too? Isn't it, isn't it terrible to person B? Person B says, no, I actually, actually don't find it all that tedious. <laughs> In fact, I'm looking forward to the year. Well, how can he say that? It's the same job, same room, same parts, same everything. Well, here's the difference. There's a very stark distinction between them. Though they are in identical circumstances, they are interpreting their experience in radically different ways because of their expectations, because their hopes are different. 
Their hopes are not the same. And so that then leads to them interpreting their experience now differently because of what their ex expectation is, what the result will be of their work is so different because their hopes are different as a result. They experience circumstances differently. And their beliefs about the future radically and completely determine how they experience the present. And those people are us. Those people are us. Our hope as a believer is found in aiming at heaven. That's what we do. Jesus addresses this in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 6. He's doing this amazing teaching. And he's just pouring it out. And here's what he says. Matthew 6, verses 19 through 21. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. And here it is. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. We already read in Colossians, put your heart on things above. Where your treasure is, your heart will be also. So our heart looks to heaven as our home and our hope. Our heart looks to heaven as our home and our hope. And the hope the way the Bible teaches it is different than hope today. Often when we think of the word hope today, we kind of have this Fingers crossed, knock on wood, I don't know if it's going to happen. Gosh, I hope so, I hope so. That's kind of how we do it today, but that isn't the meaning of the word when it was written long ago in Scripture. The Greek meaning of the word hope is a strong expectation. And the Hebrew meaning of the word hope is a strong rope. So we literally have this strong rope we can hold on to because we have this strong expectation, meaning it's a reality that's already been assured by accepting Christ as our Savior. So this definition of hope is critical to how we live. Because we need to know that our lives have meaning. We need to know that our lives have purpose. We need these things. We were built for these things. We don't want to think that we're just cruising through until it's over. We can't afford that. So another author wrote about what hope func how hope functions and what it's made of. And he said, hope is made of desire and expectation. Desire and expectation. And so the reality is whatever we expect to fulfill our desires is our hope. Whatever we expect to fulfill our desires is our hope. So hope is what we expect and what we are sure will fulfill our deepest desires. So that leads us to the next important question. Can the things of the world and the pursuit of them fulfill these deeper desires and longings? See, Christian scholars have taught for a long, long time that most of us, probably all of us, have desires deeper than we really know. See, that's according to our construction. Imago Dei, made in the image of God, we have these deep longings and these deep desires, and we're all built with them. And the tendency is, and I can fall into this, is to go out in the world and think, well, then I, I'm going to go get this and, and accumulate that, and I'm going to fulfill these desires. And the temptation is right there. We think of maybe honors, victory, Victories, money. We think of prestige. We think of political causes, perhaps. We think of collections. We think of perfect health, perfect love. It's got to be out here. It'll solve it once for, and for all. It'll just quell that thirst, that hunger I have inside. And yet it doesn't. It doesn't. See, ancient Greek philosophers knew this. They commented long ago, that, you know, they would observe, you know, people go after these things of the world then, but similar to the world now, and they, they strive for them and they drive to get them 
But in reality, over time, all they experience is eventual disappointment. There's no evidence that the things of this world can satisfy the deep longings of the human heart. There's no evidence anywhere. Even the ancient non-Christian Greek philosophers knew that. So here's our problem. We do live here. We're in the world. We're not of it, but we're right here, aren't we? And we're going to leave this campus today and see the temptations of what the world has to offer out there. We are. It's a reality. So there are many ways we can focus that can mislead us. Again, that all kinds of ways. I'm going to list a few here. And when I think of focus, here's what came up for me. I got something in the bag. It's really important to me. This is my scuba mask. This is an excellent scuba mask. It's an atomic. If you know masks, it's an excellent mask. It goes like this. You already knew that because it doesn't work like this. You know the most important thing I do before I go in diving? Old school, all the way. Spit in my mask. Rub it all around. Do all that. You can buy fluids to do that, mask cleaners. I don't do it. I don't know why. This works every time. And why do I do that? Because of focus. Focus. If you're a diver, you know this. If you don't prepare the lens, it fogs up. You can't see. There's nothing you can do about it once you're underwater. Nothing. If you didn't do the lens right, you're done. Focus. You can't see what's there. I see nodders. I, I see divers nodding. You can't see what's there. You spent all this time, you invested all this hope and all this energy into, into experiencing this beautiful world, and you can't even see it. And the worst is, once you're underwater, you can't fix it. You can rinse it out periodically, fogs up again, then you're out of air. And the worst for me is when I go on these dive charter trips, we're going to dive 15 times in two and a half days and you brought the wrong mask, and you don't have any way to defog it, or it doesn't fit, you can't focus, you can't see. It changes how you experience the entire thing. So let me give you some examples of other ways that an earthly focus misleads us. How about this? This can mislead us, a focus on getting my value and identity from earthly things around me. So I tell people I dive, I like to fish, I like to spearfish. Oh, you're a spear fisherman? Well, not really, no. That's not my identity. It's something I do. See, I don't want to fall into that. Oh, you're a fisherman. Well, I like fishing, but that's not who I am. It's, it's only something I do. I'm a child of the living God. I received my adoption into the kingdom. That's my identity. I don't want to ever think this world can give me an identity. That identity will crumble. It's a misleading focus. How about this? A focus on getting my sense of security here. I can get that sense of safety and security and I'm going to be protected and preserved by setting up all the right mechanisms in life and that will give it to me and it's not true. We're not in control. That's a fantasy. Here's a common focus. I can focus on accumulating enough money and material goods to stop worry and joy. Enough money. Columbia University does a periodic study across the country. And one of the fundamental questions in, the, in this study is, how much more money would you need to just kind of be where you want to be? And the answer is 10% more. They've done this survey, re, survey regularly for over 30 years, and it's always 10% more. 10% more. What we have now is never enough. Doesn't that tell you something about who we are and what the world can and can't offer? It's never going to be enough if you're looking to fulfill the deep longing. How about this? A focus on experiencing consistent pleasure. We can fall into this trap thinking, because I do experience pleasure with me, it's fish, fish tacos. And, and, but there's so many things, you, you know, soak in a hot tub. There's all kinds of things that we experience pleasure, but we can fall into the trap of thinking, I should be experiencing that all the time. And I need to live my life looking for it and make sure it's feeding me those sensory pleasure experiences all the time and it's misleading and it's a bad focus. How about this? A focus on finding perfect love. It, love men and women, love friends, love in the family. And we, we hold up this criteria that you need to be literally like Jesus, perfect in every way. 
do everything right all the time or else love is bad. We, that can be a trap. And this one, a focus on not aging. Oh, my word. Kind of in. No, I'm just kidding. It's a mega billion dollar industry worldwide. And what is it? It's at least two things. One, I want to look like I'm not aging. And then I want to figure out stuff I can actually do to slow aging. And I'm not against people saying, I want to look my best. Of course. I want to do stuff to kind of, you know, have a good appearance and all those things. But the difference is, for many in the world today, is that not knowing they have a forever permanent home ends up being, this is the only home I've got. I've got to look as good as I can in it and stretch it as long as I can. That focus won't fulfill the deep longings in the human heart. It cannot do it. How about this one? A focus on finding self-worth from other people's opinions. We call it the WPTs, what people think. It can be such a fragile way to live. Such a rocky way to live. Almost like, well, how are you doing? I don't know. You can ask my neighbors, do they still like me or not? Well, what do you think? Well, I don't know what I think. I got to figure out what everybody else thinks about me. And then I'll let you know if I'm good today or not. It's a horrible, fragile way to live day in and day out. And it won't satisfy the deep longings. So why can't these things satisfy these deeper parts of us? Why can't they? Maybe it's because of something else C.S. Lewis said. He said, if I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is I was made for another world. We were made for heaven. There's people who know it and people I hope discover it. If you already know that, you already have salvation. You already have your eternity secure. I hope you're sharing it with somebody else because it's the best, right? We're made for that eternity with our Lord. This here is a rough stop along the way. It really is, and it can be tough. Paul talks about it in his letter to Timothy, whom he's grooming to, to rise up in ministry and teaching. And he says in 1 Timothy 6, Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant. You notice he doesn't say, don't command people, command people to not be rich. He doesn't say that. Here's what he says. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor hear it, nor to put their hope in wealth. Which is what? So uncertain. History shows us that. But to put their hope in God. Aim at heaven who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. And he goes on to say, command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, here it is, in this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation in the coming age. Remember what Jesus said, treasure in heaven. Paul's saying it here to Timothy. And I love this next phrase. I never really got this till I prepared for this message. He says, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. Th this way of living is truly living. It's the best living there is. Aiming at heaven and living it daily. And we learn in the book of Hebrews, what does it take? It takes faith to do this. It takes faith. Faith meaning that active sort of belief and understanding that you rekindle daily to remind yourself, I have an eternal and forever home. I love the one scripture in Hebrews of so many, but there's one that stands out to me. Faith is assurance of things what? Hope for. And convictions, conviction of things what? Not yet seen. Faith is assurance. There's a word. Assurance. Strong expectation, the strong rope, assurance of things hoped for, and conviction of things not yet seen. And when we do this, the possibility for meaning and purpose in our daily life for power and fruit and outcome and joy is endless. It's endless. Each day takes on great meaning and importance. 
because each day brings us powerful opportunities to live this way. So I'm thinking, you might be wondering, how does it really work? I mean, how do people do this? We asked our staff. We, we said, would you be willing to share how you do it? How, how, how do you live each day with, a, with, with your aim at heaven and live a powerful and meaningful life today? How do you do it? I want to read to you some of what they shared. Here's one. The question is, what does daily living look like for you knowing that heaven and eternity with our Father is secure? One staff member said it is a life filled with great expectation, hope, and joy for the future, even if I am struggling to find joy in the day before me. And this is particularly true if I find myself struggling with losses in this life, whether it be a loved one who loved Jesus or even experiencing losses because of life stages. I know there will be a time in my future when all things will be restored, and this gives me hope each day. Another staff member shared this. Knowing that heaven and eternity with Jesus is secure assures me what I've already learned from Scripture, that life is fleeting and the small stuff doesn't matter. You ever hear that old saying? Don't sweat the small stuff and everything is small stuff. You can almost see the roots in Scripture. You almost can. It's a great reminder for this staff person. Here's another one. Prior to being a Christian and knowing that I would be going to heaven, I would wake up in the middle of the night with an anxiety attack, thinking about death and, and the fact that I'd just be gone. I'll just be gone. I became a Christian. I accepted Jesus, invited him into my heart. And I knew from that moment on, like I know today, I'm going to be with him forever. I'll be in heaven. I don't wake up with anxiety attacks anymore. They're gone. Another said, for me, knowing my eternity is secure reminds me to look ahead and consider, and she quotes from 2 Corinthians 4, 17, our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that outweighs them all. It gives me a longer perspective of life and gives me hope when things are difficult. And another staff member quoted a theologian of times gone by who's well-known and highly regarded, A.W. Tozer. And there's a quote from A.W. Tozer to address this. When the followers of Jesus Christ lose their interest in heaven, they will no longer be happy Christians. And when they're no longer happy Christians, they cannot be a powerful force in a sad and sinful world. It may be said with certainty that Christians who've lost their enthusiasm about the Savior's promises of heaven to come have also, hear this, stopped being effective in Christian life and witness in this world. That's the risk we run when we take our aim off heaven and put it here in the world. That's the risk we run. That's a beautiful quote and a great reminder. I have another. I do not have the fear of the unknown anymore, whether stepping onto a street or in a combat zone or even in my own neighborhood. I can prioritize my day. And what has eternal value is my first priority in the day. Being in God's word, prayer alone with my wife. Community with other believers, connected with non-believers. And I know things will get better even on my best days and certainly on my worst. And another, knowing that my, my eternity is secure in the Father has given me freedom. Freedom. Freedom from my own anxieties, worry, guilt, and shame, and resting and the fact that I am not in control, and I don't have to be. I live my life with open hands because of this, and I praise him for the blessings, holding nothing too tightly, and inviting him to sit with me in the pain and the hard times. And living in this truth looks like praying for 
opportunities to share this freedom with friends, family members, and those I encounter daily. I don't do it perfectly every day, but it's my guide. So my challenge to you today is how is it going to look for you? We have preached recently a series on spiritual pathways using the work of Gary Thomas. And in that book, we learn, and Thomas did a beautiful job of outlining many of the different ways we can uniquely come into worship with our Father, meaning we're different. We don't have to be the same. We have all these different ways this works, and it's the same for this. You may not experience any of these things that I read to you from the staff, and it may be your own unique way that living each day with your aim at heaven works for you, but would you be willing to pray about it? Ask God to show you that. Lord, show me. I am Imago Dei. I am unique. I'm a masterpiece. Ephesians 2.10. I'm of one of a kind. In that, you've gifted me, and you've given me talents and abilities and capacities that are just mine. Will you guide and direct me? How am I to live this day, then the next day, fully and effectively and powerfully, and the entire time, with my aim at heaven, and my focus on eternity, in my permanent and forever home. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Lord, for, for fulfilling your promise. You told us all the way in Genesis chapter 3 that there was a plan to redeem this broken world and broken people. And it took a long time by world standards, Father, but you fulfilled every promise you ever made. And Jesus, you paid the price for us. You became sin so that sin would be killed forever. And because of that, we can approach you, Father. We are reconciled. We're living by grace in the new covenant. And we have an eternal home, and we celebrate that today. And it's all a gift. And it's all a gift that comes from the love you have for your children. We praise you for that, and we gratefully receive that. And we thank you for it all in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Well, Dennis, thank you for the reminder that through Jesus Christ, we're victorious and have the hope of heaven. We're in walking in his victory, and we have the hope of this life now uh, pointing towards heaven. And I want to invite you next Sunday, we finish this series called Victorious. We started before Easter, uh, but we finished it this, this coming Sunday. And what we're going to be talking about this coming Sunday is the way to victory. How does a person find ultimate, final victory for eternity? How do you find your way to Jesus? If you know anybody who is even a little bit open to know about Jesus Christ and how to walk with him and follow him and receive him, be sure if you're online, send them an invitation, ask them to come and join you online. If you're in your car, ask them to come and park next to you or to sit in your car with you. If you're in the courtyard, wherever you are, invite, pray about who you would invite to hear the story of the way to victory because they'll, they'll be blessed, they'll be transformed. Before I ask you to stand for a word of blessing and just a couple things. First of all, we have a baptism class uh, today at one o'clock. That's in about 50 minutes. Enough time to go grab a quick bite to eat and come on back or if you're at home, come and join uh, Pastor Roy at one o'clock. If, if you are a follower of Jesus and you've never been baptized, I challenge you to come at one o'clock and learn what that's about and consider being baptized. Second, we're launching a lot of new small groups. We have some continuing small groups, new small groups. Some of them are online. Some of them are in person. Some of them are on our church campus. Some of them are in homes. Lots and lots of small groups. Uh, we encourage you to consider for six to 10 weeks, try jumping into a small group and connecting with people and see what God does through that. I think it'll be a real blessing to you. So tomorrow you'll receive an email. If you don't, that means you're not in our mailing database. Let us know and we'll add you to that. But you should get an email that says uh, small group finder. And when you click on that, it opens up and it tells you where the group is, who's in the group, what kind of group it is, what they're studying. Every single group we have is right there. So you can kind of go online and see which one would fit. Some of them say already full because some of them have only like 10 to 12 people, but most are still open. So check that out when you get your email tomorrow. Also, Sherry and I occasionally get a chance uh, when we're here to just be available to talk with folks. So we're going to actually be back in the booth behind Patty's booth there, uh, past the balloons there. There's another booth, and Sherry and I will be there. If you're new at Shoreline, or if we haven't seen you like in a year, uh, come on back and say hi to us and chat with us. We'd love to, to greet you and give you a warm, personal uh, welcome. If you need prayer, Pastor Dennis just finished preaching where he's working double duty today. He's preaching, and now he's up here at the back, at the top of the stairs there with the team. If you have a prayer need, you're in the courtyard, go there for prayer. If you're online... 
Would you just e either email your prayer need, and we'll pray for that in the coming week, or call the number you see on your screen, and there's someone waiting right now to pray with you personally and to lift that need up before the Lord uh, with you. And then if you're new today at Shoreline, uh, if you're here on campus, we're so glad you're here. If you're brand new, please, before you leave, kind of from your car, jump out of your car or jump out of your spot here, go back to the balloons there. Patty's there with her team. That's our connection center. And just go. She wants to give you a little gift and thank you for coming. And she also wants to answer any questions you have about Shoreline Church. So if you're new, don't leave here without going by the connection center uh, and, and meeting the folks there and sharing what's on your heart and how we can come alongside of you. Uh, I want to invite you to uh, stand for a word of blessing. If you'd stand with me, and I want to give you a word of blessing as we send you out. And I want to say this. After I give a word of blessing... I'm going to ask you to do something, and I'm going to give you a little, just a short commentary on it. After I give a word of blessing, I'm going to ask you just to pop your mask back on as you walk off the campus, as you walk to your car. It'll be 20, 30, 40 seconds. Now, let me be clear about something. There's Christians in the world who are suffering and being persecuted. We have brothers and sisters who are being killed. Their homes are being burned. They're being hurt for their faith. Popping a mask on for 30 seconds to serve your brothers and sisters in Christ is not suffering. It's not persecution. It's just being polite, Right? And so even if you, I mean, and let me tell you, I don't like masks. If I could never wear a mask again starting right now, I would never wear another mask. But there are some people in our church family who are anxious and concerned, and that's hard for them. We honor them. And I know a church right now that half their pastoral staff has COVID. One is in the hospital. A bunch of children are getting COVID in that church. And they've been very, they, they've been very open about things. And we, we, I, our, our caution is not out of anxiety or worry. It's just trying to honor everyone where they're at. So please, after I send you off the word of blessing, just joyfully or unjoyfully, pop your mask on and walk off campus and have a great day. But let me give you a word of blessing, all right? Uh, as you go from this place, may you walk in the victory of Jesus. If you put your faith in him, you have two homes and one of them is in heaven. Shoot for heaven. Keep your eyes on heaven. Keep your eyes on Jesus. And in the victorious power of Jesus, serve him in this world so others will know him too. God bless you. Have a great week. Walk in the victory of Jesus. And we will see you back here next Sunday for the final sermon in the Victoria series. God bless you. Have a great week.